Lily Von Lickman Show, the show that explores the human component around business development and marketing aspects. I'm Liron Lickman, your host, and today I'm so excited to have Mike Walsh with me. Mike, how are you? I'm great. It's wonderful to be on your show. It's so amazing to have you, and I'm sure uh, the, the audience will learn uh, why in a few minutes. Um, Mike is a futurist and the CEO of Tomorrow. And he's a global keynote speaker and author of the Algorithmic Leader book, which we're going to talk about uh, very soon. Uh, tell me where you are now in the world, because you're traveling and it's really hard to keep up. <laughs> I, uh, well, I was, in, uh, I was in Nashville yesterday. I'm in London today. And then in a few days time, I'll be in Singapore. The first main question I want to ask you is, what does it mean to be a futurist? And how, how can we predict, predict the future of companies these days? Weirdly, I think the real job of a futurist is not to talk about the future, but to try to understand the present. Uh, in that, if you're a leader in, in this complex and changing and dynamic environment that we're now in, you're faced with lots of choices about where to invest, uh, what to focus on, what's important, what to pay attention to, what really matters. And my job, the way I see it, is to really travel the world looking for ideas and people and technologies that have the potential to transform our perspectives and how we do things. Then I help people really pick the right path that they need to take now. Yeah. So um, in this regards, um, when you actually, um, you know, travel the world, what, what do you see? Um, what is kind of, how, how come the future threatens corporate these days from all your findings and researches? We're, we're, we're leaving a time where you could reliably make 10, even five year plans, uh, where you could have long development cycles and you could research a market and do lots of surveys and then do a business model and a cash flow projection and then know that whatever you had designed would make you money for yeah. 10, 20, 30 years. This was really the analog age. Yeah. It was the age of the industrial revolution. We're entering now a new age. Uh, I call it an algorithmic age because in this world, what matters is data and machines and artificial intelligence. And the cycle of innovation and change has become so rapid that that kind of mindset that we had in the analog era just, just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And so this is really important for organizations today because if they want to survive and thrive, they have to completely change not just their operating model, but their entire culture. Yeah. So you basically say that data is one of the main threats on companies in a way. It's, it's, not, just, it's, it's not just, it's not really data, it's experiences. experiences. The, the new generation of customers, clients, employees, partners, their baseline of what they expect in terms of a good experience mm -hmm. has so profoundly changed. And it's changed because of our everyday lives. Uh, when kids grow up today, they don't grow up with television, they grow up with Netflix. They don't grow up with CDs, they grow up with Spotify. Yeah. Um, and this changes the way they expect banking, healthcare, financial services, retail to operate. So the algorithmic leader, what, how, what, is, what are his characteristics then? How could you become an algorithmic leader? A brand new book. Read a book. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, yeah. so, I mean, really the premise of this book was how do, we, how do we come up with something positive about what people can focus on? There's, there's way too much uh, discussion and fear at the moment that automation or even AI or robots are here to destroy work, to undermine industries and to uh, really change the world irrevocably. But if you think about it, whenever there's been a new technology, we've always gone through this process of evolution and adaption. Uh, you know, even in the, in the last big transformation, it wasn't that computers took away jobs from people. People with computers took away jobs from people that refused or were incapable of using them. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it from that perspective, AI and algorithms, automation, are just another kind of a tool. And to be an effective leader or an effective algorithmic leader in this new world, I really think you're gonna need two very different sets of skills. Okay. On one Why? side, you're gonna to need to have a, a deep, understanding and knowledge of human complexity, mm -hmm. which is the ability to, I don't know, empathize, uh, to know what a good experience is, uh, to motivate other people. Uh, these are analog human emotional concepts, which machines, maybe they can, um, you know, maybe they can mimic, but they can never truly understand. And they will always stay, right? Those 
we, we hope that yes. they will always stay. The human connection, what you mean, that's what yeah, you mean. And look, you can train a machine to know when a human is angry, yeah. but a machine will never, unless it's a human who's making that contextual understanding, it, it kind of loses meaning. It, it's like saying, you know, if a, a machine can create a piece of art, but yeah. a, the fact that it was made by a human is what gives it context. So that's one set of things. But it's, it, sometimes we also think that's sufficient, that somehow if we just focus on the warm and fluffy relationships, that'll be enough to save us. Yeah. But we also need to take on some of the best qualities of machines as well. So one of the things I argue about in, in my new book is that we have to become more effective computational thinkers. Yeah. And what that really means is, is that the way we approach um, making decisions, solving problems and coming up with ideas has to also become a little bit more structured that will allow us to reliably incorporate data and technology to augment our, uh, our human capacities. Yeah, because you know, in your book, you, you, you were talking on the, the use of, of the data and information in, in two ways. On the one hand, you say, okay, trust the algorithm, trust the data. On the other hand, you say, you know, think, always ask why, and always kind of just keep your own thinking. So how, how does this all, you know, come together eventually, if there's any, you know, formula? Yeah, so, you know, it, 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 there's, there's no hard and fast rules, uh, because yeah. this is still, uh, but we have to fight some of our in, inherent biases. I mean, you're right, one, one bias we can have is to assume that machines are evil and we can't trust them. And, and, and actually, this, this has been a, an ongoing issue with our relationship with technology. I mean, if you, if you even look back at the early days of sure. space program, uh, yeah. they, 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 uh, they actually chose um, test pilots because uh, they thought, you know, these are pilots who are used to being in like life and death situations. They're excellent um, navigators and yeah. uh, technicians. But these were the worst possible people to choose. They actually should have chosen radar operators because, uh, you know, essentially you took someone who is full of testosterone and, and loves to, you know, the thrill of, of being close to death, and you yeah. say, sit in an aluminium can and don't touch anything. And so they really resented the high levels of automation. And they were always asking for ma more manual controls. So, you know, we have a natural tendency yeah. as humans to not trust automation. And I think what we need to do is we need to, to build systems that incorporate people's fears and context and experiences uh, so that people can understand that their knowledge is being embedded in the system and then they can then learn to trust it. So that, that's one thing. Yeah. But then we have to also know when not to trust these systems. Uh, we sometimes think that because a machine is doing it, it's somehow not biased and objective. But we forget the machines are trained on data that's been collected by humans and that's about humans. So it can easily be biased. There can easily be discrimination embedded in the data. Uh, the data can reflect the imperfection of the world it came from. Yeah. And because, you know, when we talk about the actual companies and the way they actually use it, and as you said, it's also about, um, it could be experiences. You gave some example in your book about uh, the, uh, one of the airlines incidents, if you want to share that. Um, I think the main question would be, what kind of rituals should companies harness to adapt this new, you know, fast-paced, multi-data world. Like also, you mentioned um, the Scrum meetings and Jeff Bezos, the uh, fact that he wants people to tell more stories than show presentations. So there are even like small interaction, human interaction um, yeah. things that actually um, here to adapt to the data world in a way, right? Well, we, we sometimes look at new technology and think it's just a matter of installing the technology and we can somehow yeah. change. But when you change your technology, in a way, you're just changing the hardware of your business. If you really want to transform, you've got to figure out how to make culture your operating system. Because culture is the way we interact. It's the way we collaborate. It's the way we run meetings. It's the way we uh, solve problems uh, or identify what really matters for our customers. This is culture. And so meetings are critical, you know, as, as, as you identified. And, and I did, I wrote a chapter on this because if you think about what's going on, we, it's not that technology helps us by being more efficient or cutting costs. What technology really does is it gives us data. Yeah. But we have to use that data to change the way we do things and the way we approach situations. So Amazon's a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, they've banned PowerPoint at the company, which I think yeah. is fantastic because I mean, you know, we've all been in those situations where you've gone to a meeting and it's like, I don't know. Yeah. Like three, you, you, you know, they've, they've kindly put at the bottom of the slide how many slides are ahead. So exactly. it's like they're signposting your impending misery. Exactly. Uh, it's like one out of 300. You, you know, you're like, this is two hours of my life. I'm never going to get back. Mm -hmm. 
so what at Amazon they do is that they say, okay, no PowerPoint. If you want to come to a meeting and get a decision made, you've got to come with a six page memo that has a stack of data appendices. So the first 15 minutes of a meeting at Amazon is spent in silence and they're not meditating or, you know, chanting. They're actually just reading the memo and they, then they go through point by point to see if the data supports the hypothesis and the hypothesis ultimately supports the overall company objective of improving the customer experience. Yeah. So that's when data stops becoming something created by technology and starts to becoming something that's weaponized to transform the way you do things. Yeah. That's, that's a very interesting example as well. So what do you think in terms of the culture? So what would be, um, what companies leaders um, should um, start harnessing in order to make this, you know, uh, ongoing change of culture towards, um, you know, the new era? I, I think you have to start by looking at how you make your meetings and your decisions more data driven mm -hmm. and how you introduce technology and automation and artificial intelligence at appropriate places. I mean, if you think about it, there are, companies are just a collection of decisions. I mean, that's what they do. They're a machine for making decisions. And what we can do is try to increase the velocity of high quality decisions. Yeah. And this is not just for big companies. In fact, if you're a small company, if you're a startup that has limited resources, mm -hmm. your ability to make more high quality decisions, you actually, is actually even more essential because this is the only way that you can grow and the way you can add value. So this is really where I would start. And I often think that there are different degrees of decisions, first, second, and third order magnitude. And it, it kind of really depends on, you know, is this decision truly strategic and complex or is it something simple that can just be automated? Yeah, that's very interesting. And you know, in terms of startups, so um, a, a good part of the audience is also startups and usually they work, you know, in teams. Also there are teams in corporates, but um, today, you know, more than ever you find remote teams, so what would be the, the recommendations for team? How could they be more effective in the way they work together? Uh, I think, you know, we, we have to look at the dynamics of teams. And, and so, first of all, teams shouldn't be too big. Uh, uh, Amazon uh, classically says they, sh they should be two pizza teams, you know, no bigger than to be fed with two pizzas. Okay. And yeah. you've seen other big organizations like ING. They went two through pizza. a whole uh, transformation. Um, mm -hmm. So they broke their you know, they broke their entire organization down into about 359 person squads. Mm -hmm. uh, but the composition of the teams also matters. You know, you need to have different skills. You need to have diversity of thinking and background. You can actually use algorithms. And this is something that I also looked at to mm -hmm. assign the right kinds of people with the right skills for the right kind of problem or project. So you want to introduce as much dynamism and diversity into what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. Because really the function of a team is to solve a problem. Yeah. or to come up with an idea and 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 you need flexibility and agility to do that exactly and and you know and, and in this regards as well um you mentioned about you know also their knowledge and there is you know all those online learning uh systems programs that are now like like udemy and coursera and so many others there is another one called jolt which has offices in israel and also in london which i'm a part of so it's, they all kind of say that, you know, in our new world, you, because it changes so fast, you always need to learn more and to be, you know, on top of everything. So what would be the skills that you recommend um, people to, to learn, you know, in order to be better employees, in order to, to give more value in this, you know, ever-changing world? Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's, there's no one thing, but, but definitely yeah. the ability to incorporate analytics, uh, statistics, probability, and data into your decision-making to understand the systems that will be automating decisions. And we see, you know, in the future in AI, we'll look at lots of data and be able to say, you know, there's a high, uh, that this is, this is my recommendation for what you do. But it'll give it to you within a confidence margin. It'll say, this is, I'm, you know, 90% sure this is correct. So you're gonna need the skill to understand how that computer operates, where the data came from, can it be relied on? Because it's not the making of the decision that matters now for you to add value. It's yeah. your ability to know when to trust it. It's your ability to design an effective system for automating your work. You see, in the future, we won't work. We're going to design work. Yeah. That's where we're going to add the most value, to be able to be a systems thinker and to be able to look at whatever we're doing and go, how can I, how can I combine systems and technology and data to ensure that no one has to do this manually anymore? 
Yeah, and I don't know if, if you know, this knowledge is out there so, you know, if it's so popularly out there, a part of, you know, if you've studied like uh, uh, computer science and stuff like that, but um, I, I definitely agree with you. It, it makes it more sense and I hope, you know, people could learn more on, the, on this. Um, but, you know, and, and you, have, you probably saw the, uh, the, the World Economic Forum where they predicted that, you know, so many machines and automations were going to take so many work, um, places of work, and then again, there are going to be new um, um, roles that are not even existing today. People are going to be more, you know, self-employed and freelancers. Um, what do you say about this apocalyptic, you know, prediction? It, it, it's hard to... It's hard sometimes to really know uh, the, the long-term impacts because they're not as simple as just losing a job. And actually, you yeah. know, jobs change all the time. I, I mean, even if, if the people who are watching your show think about their own jobs, uh, it wasn't as if they studied something particular to end up what they were doing. And even if they did, probably the things that they use on a daily basis to be successful was not something they got out of books or on an internet course. Yeah. It's learned by trial and error because we are all actually um, machine learning systems in yeah. a sense. I mean, we take in information and it, we output patterns and we use those heuristics and patterns to become more effective at recognizing patterns and the effective. So the idea of a job itself is maybe what will change the most in that there is this static thing that can be summed up with a title and a paycheck. Because um, in the future, we, you know, the, the future is going to require us to become more dynamic and more flexible because the kinds of problems you can't automate mm -hmm. are going to be more difficult to solve. So you're not going to be able to, if there is an easy way that's easily definable with an, easy, with an obvious job, yeah. a computer will do it. So almost by definition, in order to remain relevant, we have to get used to the idea of not having jobs. Yeah. Or as you said, try to probably be more um, you know, specialized in fields that computers will be harder for them to, to solve them. You know, th that, I don't think that will be a, a very <laughs> good thing to do because yeah. the boundary is always going to be moving. Yeah. Uh, they, they, I mean, you, you take, uh, I mean, almost any example from whether it's being a doctor um, to being a lawyer or an accountant, I mean, any professional service that's very specialized, uh, there's being advances made. So the answer isn't to find an area where the machines can't go. The, the answer is, is to find where you combined with machines can have that. Find the, the point where you can combine uh, machine and your abilities. That's a good yeah. point. And to be comfortable with uncertainty mm -hmm. and constant change because that line will also hard. be hard. Yeah. That's hard for many, many people, you know, especially... You know, the, um, the head of engineering at Airbnb um, mm -hmm. said something that I thought was really interesting. He said he actually tries to hire people that are energized by unknowns. Okay. And, and I actually think a big part of being a good employer or entrepreneur in the future is your ability to handle ambiguity and to essentially be excited by uncertainty. Uh, and, and this yeah. is difficult because sometimes we think, I'm gonna get a job and then I'll be safe. And then I can get a mortgage, yeah. assets. No one's safe in the future, but we actually need to be excited by that. Exactly, that's interesting what you say, because you know, I talk a lot about entrepreneurship as well uh, in my other um, you know, shows here. And I think, you know, when you have employees that, that have this, you know, internal drive and driven by, by answers, they also mean that people that can, I guess, test more things and, you know, try new things, which also gives, I think, better employees, better results, better abilities to change, right? Absolutely. And I also, you know, we, we mentioned earlier Amazon. And since I'm in Israel at the moment, Amazon is now entering Israel, like, you know, as a part of their global uh, domination plan. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, hype around it right now. What's going to happen to all the retailers as happened in every country that they're entering to? Do you have any uh, tip or, or, you know, way that how can the Israeli retailers should, you know, prepare for that change? I've seen Amazon move it down the markets, you know, from the UK and Australia. Yeah. It, it isn't an automatic death sentence for everyone else, but it is a, it is a warning. Because if your business simply relied on providing goods to people and providing access to them, you're in big trouble. Yeah. If you cannot compete on service, presentation, experience, then, then you really won't be able to exist in the same way or with the same margins as you will in the future. So from that point of view, I think anywhere where you have a data-driven algorithmic competitor with scale, 
it's really an invitation to look again at what you really do to add value. I love it. So you say it's a warning and an invitation to try to, to yeah. be, be different, be better. Yeah. And can you give us um, a glimpse into the future of corporate as much as you can see and share? Uh, I mean, it, it, there's no one thing. Uh, but I, I do think the big question yeah. we're all going to face is, you know, what is now the new smart way of doing things? You see, we've sort of gone through this digital transformation phase now, but for many companies, unfortunately, it was more like digital incrementalism. They just took whatever they were doing and they digitized elements of that physical paper process. But I think we're very fast accelerating to a time where leaders need to look again and go, okay, do we really need to do things in this way? How big do we really need to be? Um, you know, what is our operating model? If we're going to be focused on creating better experience for customers, is there another structure that we can use to achieve that? Or another set of technologies or channels or whatever it is. But I think that to me is the future of corporate is to actually really mm -hmm. think from first principles about what really drives value. Because, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we, we talk much about, again, driving value, thinking about the, uh, the customer. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of things that are happening are really about reliability and creating, let's say, a safer and more reliable world. And, you know, in the book Sapiens by uh, Yuval Noah Harari, he said that a lot of the, the rules that we live by, for example, money, d democracy, and others, were actually mistakes. So they were not planned. Of course, they were not planned, but there were a lot of, like, like just decisions that people made, and that's why we live in a certain way. Do you think the digital age will bring humanity to a better, safer, and happier world because, you know, there are more planning behind this? Uh, I think it's almost unrelated in that we will create either a heaven or a hell for ourselves to live in, mm -hmm. but it will be completely unrelated to whatever technologies we have. Uh, I mean, even if you look at these, even if you look at these, you know, uh, algorithmic or AI type tools today, I mean, there is one set of people using it to try and create more meaningful purpose driven work. And there's yeah. another set who are trying to bring back a century form of, you know, 21st century Taylorism where you measure everything people do and you manage them for maximum productivity as if they're kind of like caged chickens. So it, it, we will create yeah. either a heaven or a hell, but it, it'll be entirely up to us as to how that plays out. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's, if it's happy or not, um, you know, if, if I like or don't like your answer, but it makes so much sense. As you said, there's so many different forces that... But, but this is why I say that yeah. ultimately we shouldn't be worried about uh, computers taking our jobs. Actually, this time we're in, the algorithmic age, mm -hmm. is demanding leaders more than ever. Leadership is more important than ever because we are literally at the crossroads about many of these decisions. Uh, you know, it used to be Google's motto, uh, don't be evil. And, they've, you know, weirdly, they've stopped saying that at the very moment when we actually need to be thinking about those kinds of questions more than ever. Um, you know, when you look at the situation Facebook that was in recently, yeah. You never want to be in a position where you as a leader have to explain to governments and politicians and the press and the public your failure to fully understand all of the unintended consequences of your decisions and technologies. Because those are exactly the kinds of discussions that we should be having now about ethics and principles and values. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to call more leaders to take a stand and, you know, and make sure that create this, this world a better place through technology and algorithm. So Mike, I, I want to thank you for this amazing, amazing insights that you gave us also from um, being touched on the book as well. Um, and I want to ask you three questions that I ask every guest that I have on the show. It's more kind of more to learn a bit more about you. Um, who was the first person who believed in you or impacted your career the most? Definitely my father. I mean, my father was an amazing uh, business leader. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he left school very young. He left at 12, uh, grew up during the war. Uh, he, you know, he started life selling suits in a department store. But, he, you know, he was very successful. He was actually the CEO of Harrods in the 80s in London, mm -hmm. the Alpha Ed family. So he was a very successful retailer. Uh, so it was definitely uh, a lot of his encouragement uh, when I was very young. And also just being able to see, you know, uh, I, I think what a difference a visionary leader can, can make, you know, to to people's lives you know even I mean that was he died when I was 12 and 
you know, he was yeah. essentially working 30 years ago and uh, 30, 40 years ago. People to this day come up and stop in the street and say, listen, I remember your father. Wow. You know, he left such an impact on, on me, you know, when I was getting started. So I think that's a powerful lesson you know, that I've really taken on. For sure, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. And um, on another note, you know, you travel the world, you meet people from so many different cultures and countries. What is your, your best trait to connecting with, with strangers, with people that you meet? I think you really have to be a good listener and observer. Um, that, that's, that's the best thing because, uh, I mean, regardless, I mean, I think that always helps with, with relationships with anyone if you're listening. But yeah. from the point of view of someone who's a traveler, you know, I see the journey is always about paying more attention because mm -hmm. the more you look, the more you see. And, and that really is the power of travel is the ability to see so many different details about the way we live, the choices we make, uh, the kinds of worlds we design, the unintended yeah. consequences of things. So that's, it's definitely observation. That I think. Observation. Yes. And my last question, which relates to this is what is your version? What do you think people want? You know, it's a bit, very general question, but what do people want? Whatever other people have. <laughs> oh, interesting. The grass is always greener. I don't know. We, we're, uh, this is very much related, actually, strangely enough, to the future of work question, because mm -hmm. I, I truly believe that uh, there will never be a lack of work for people as long as people keep wanting more things. And, and that's why this whole discussion of a universal basic income is so flawed yeah. because uh, the problem with this thing is it forgets completely the fact that human beings are wired to be relative. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no such thing as a basic level of living. If you're a basic level of living, you'll look around and go, why can't I have a bit more? Mm -hmm. And, you know, any basic income that is... Uh, uh, It'll either be too little bit to be sufficient or it'll be so much that it'll bring down the whole tax system. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think ultimately um, people always want more and they want what everyone else has. <laughs> I love the answer. That's, a, that's the first time I hear this answer to this question. And um, I can definitely understand what you're saying in, in all levels. And uh, one last question for you specifically, as a world traveler, where is, what, where is your, your most favorite place to be or place you want to recommend us to go to? Could be two places or one place. You know the answer to this, Sydney. Sydney, <laughs> woo! <laughs> um, Mike, where can our uh, viewers and listeners um, reach you? Uh, they can follow me on Instagram uh, under Mike Walsh, on Twitter, the same thing, Mike Walsh. Uh, my uh, book uh, is on Amazon. Uh, so you can, uh, it's either ebook or physical, or you can uh, listen to it on Audible, um, or you can go to my website. If you just put Mike Walsh into Google, it's the, it's the, it hopefully there. it's still the first listing. And also you have um, uh, the podcast, which we talked about yeah. earlier. So if you look on iTunes or yeah. SoundCloud, it's called Between Worlds. Between Worlds. Very interesting. I love following you, you know, and seeing as part of your world travel, but also, you know, your insights and information. Mike, I want to thank you so much for joining me and sharing this again great um, uh, point of views and and information it has been a wonderful pleasure and uh, I also want to thank you uh, our viewers and listeners for being here with me of course you can like it you can share it and leave your comment over at leonlikon.com and I will answer each and every one of those thank you so much and we'll see you next time <laughs>